Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. It's been a, quite a while now since I've done a video um, last year and um, yeah, I've been quite busy and um, yeah, I, I believe that this, this message and this word that I have to give to the church is very important for the time that we are going in. Um, I will start with the word that he gave me for uh, 2023. And um, there's going to be a lot of uh, dreams, um, a bit of visions that Father has given me in this time period. And um, it's basically going to be a testimony of um, what I've been through um, in the past month or so. So um, the message in itself, or what I've gone through in itself, is a message to the church. And... Um, I believe Father wants to speak to us individually as well as corporately. So I want to start just with us praying and just ask Father's blessing upon this message. Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to be able to minister to your bride, a privilege that I cannot possibly be able to express, Father. The, the privilege, the joy, the honor, I'm humbled, Father. And I thank you, Father, that I am just the instrument and I just give my mouth to you to speak through me that which you want to speak. Um, take away that which is of me. Take away that that could possibly um, be as a filter through which I speak, Father. Thank you for anointing my, my lips. Thank you for anointing me and that your presence is with us as you speak this word. I pray, open our ears and our eyes to see what you want to say. I just thank you for this opportunity, Father. We bless you in the name of Yeshua, I pray. Okay, so I first off would just want to start with by saying, and I've, I've said this numerous times, that the church in itself, in the time that we are going in, in the Great Tribulation, will in itself be an apostolic and a prophetic entity. Now the word apostolic mean, comes from the word apostolos, which means the sent ones. And it means it's a reference to the workers that will be here during the course of the tribulation to bring in a great harvest. And through the years, he has been preparing those workers through a lot of hardship and preparing their characters and molding them to be able to be um, light in the darkness and hope through which he will display his glory and um, bring many to salvation. So he's going to say, now there's ma uh, many uh, um, examples in the word of God that is a reference to this, to the workers. He talks about the harvesters. Um, so we need to understand the word has to be read, not just in what happened in the past, but also the present, also es eschatologically, which is the future, that which will be. So, there will be workers sent out. That is the apostolic part of it. And it's got a lot to do with shepherding, community, um, displaying his power and his glory and looking after his children as shepherds do after the sheep. So the prophetic part of the church is that she in herself as a prophetic entity will um, display and demonstrate the cross in a real felt reality. Um, people will not just hear of the cross, the price of the cross, but they will see it demonstrated by the lives that these workers will be willingly lay down. And whatever they do will be in itself a message. That is what a prophet is. You get a gift of prophecy. That is exhortation, helping people and uh, ministering to people. That's called the gift of prophecy. But then you get the office of prophets, prophet of a prophet where the prophet becomes himself a message what he does and how he lives is a message so in this same way father has allowed me to go through various things to be in myself a message and a type and shadow so that you can understand the things that he will take us through even if it's just a small degree that he showed me these things okay so i'm going to just start off with um, with, I would say probably about 13, 14 years ago, closer to 14 years ago, 
um, I was still under the impression that there won't be something like a rapture or an escape where the bride will leave. Um, I truly believe that um, the whole church will be go th going through the whole of the tribulation. And I was listening to sermons completely sold out to that. And as I was listening to it and realizing the type of trauma and just what will happen, um, it overwhelmed me one night and I went to, uh, to my room making up my bed just getting ready to to go sleep and i asked for the first time in my life i asked for the lord god to give me a dream i was very persistent i was i want a dream for you to show me whether i will be here during the course of the tribulation at that time i had no idea of what a worker is and that there is actually something like a worker so he already prepared me long in advance so here is the dream that he showed me a dream was divided into three parts and there's a purpose why I'm telling you this dream because it holds true and forms, a, a, I would say, a line through everything that will be spoken. So the first part of the dream is I'm seeing myself standing um, in a doorway of what looked like an island overlooking uh, or looking over to a mountain um, pretty close by and the next moment I saw the waters of a tsunami coming over the mountain right over the mountain on its way to me um, which will literally have been in a few seconds I calmly lift up my hand and I just said still and the moment I said those words the water simply just stopped at my feet and didn't even touch me so that was a display of power of his glory of great miracles that will happen Okay, the next part of the scene or the dream is where the waters actually do come in and I see myself tumbling inside of the water as it fills the whole hut or the whole house and I'm turning around and just, you know, trying to get out of the water and the next moment the water just simply dissipated, just disappeared and the next moment I could see that I did not even have a drop of water on my clothing even though I was in the water. That is with reference to um, the word where Yeshua told his disciples that some of them will be cast into prison and others, not even the hair on their head, will, um, will be harmed. So that is a reference to the type of protection that will be our portion as well. The next part of the dream, um, I saw um, Yeshua walking down the stairs, um, wooden stairs, and I could see through his eyes and he was holding a platter a wooden platter filled with the most voluptuous fruit hanging over it very very much in abundance and I and a few other people were sitting at a table downstairs as he walked down to us and then he started to serve us at this table and sitting next to us and that is with reference to the scripture where Yeshua says that he in the end will come and serve those workers who were willing to lay their lives down and he himself will come and sit and dine with them so I did not know any of these scriptures, but as the years went past, he revealed these to, to me and I obviously gained understanding. Now the focus why I wanted to relay this dream of so many years ago is the focus of water. Now um, a lot of people have received visions and dreams, including me, of um, tsunamis that will overtake the world in different areas of the world, specifically Manhattan, New York and those areas on the East Coast and the West Coast. So water is very much part of what it would appear to be the beginning of the tribulation. And we know that when it comes to these tsunamis, that of course there are earthquakes involved. And very much we see the earthquakes just taking a whole new dimension um, in their magnitude as well, specifically in Turkey that just happened this past few days. So recently um, in 2023 the first day father gave me a word for 2023 and um, that word is called glory and i would like to read this word to you and it sounds uh, amazing you know that the word is called glory but we have to understand that um, father works within us to become vessels to hold that glory and in order to become those vessels prepared to hold that glory that means with great responsibility uh, or with great power comes great responsibility which means you need the character 
to uphold that glory and authority that he will give. So he prepares the vessels for the glory. Having said that, let's read the word that he gave me um, on the first of the first. A time of great testing is upon you. You know that your faith is more precious than gold and that I've brought you through seasons of testing. But the greater the requirement, the greater the preparation. Know that I have forged the weapons of destruction to destroy all that which stands between you and me. For I am indeed jealous, jealous for my glory. You wish for my glory to be displayed through you and upon you. But know that this will and can only be upon those set apart unto me. For I am holy and require your heart to be perfect towards me. Yes, you may not want to hear this. You may be tired, but I know what you can endure and what I have purposed for you. Do not think that this testing will be as always. Rather, lay all at my feet and allow me to orchestrate the boundaries of your testing. Did I not say that I will lead you in the paths of righteousness, even if it is through the valley of the shadow of death? Do not think this testing will come as you know it. He says that again. It will be not only in a greater degree, but in another form. Are you willing to lay it all down for my glory? Know that those who know much or have received much, much is required. A greater self-denial where you lay your life down over and over. Many will fall by the wayside. I know who they are and will pick them up and carry them. Many will turn away saying, this is too hard. But those who endure will receive a crown. Great testing, my children, but of my doing. Will you trust me to finish the work in you that I have started? Am I not the master workman who make vessels of honor to serve in the master's house? Therefore, run this race with endurance. Set your face as a flint, forgetting that which is behind, as you apprehend that which I have, have apprehended you for. You know that in order to share in my glory, you have to be made conformable unto death in suffering. This suffering is to humble you, that I may lift you up at my appointed time. Therefore, do not be discouraged. Have the mind of a child who trusts the process and the mind of a soldier who is determined to finish the course set before you. I am with you and will guide you. Listen to my instructions and humble yourself continually that you may bear the burdens with my strength. Continue to look unto me, so shall you be saved. That's quite a hefty word to receive at the beginning of a year. And Father, in his mercy, gave us that word so that we can understand that he means business. Okay, so... Shortly after this word, um, I received another dream, a very short dream. And what I dreamt was that I was standing in the shallow water of the sea. And as I was standing there, I could see these massive waves basically hovering over me, just about to crash over me. And the thought that came, it's almost as everything happened in slow motion. So the thought that came to me in that moment was, these kind of waves I cannot fight I have to go with them and they will carry me to the shore. That's the first thought that came to me. The second thought was, there will be more waves. I knew that in my heart. And then as I woke up, the Lord clearly spoke to me and said to me, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. So he's obviously referring to um, Joshua 1, where he told 
Joshua that Moses has died, that he must go over and possess the land, and that he must choose men of valor to go and possess the land, and that they are to be bold and courageous. And he tells them this because he knows that they are fearful. Canaan has giants in it. So he knew that they were fearful, but they are to be bold and courageous. Okay, so Father gives me this dream with all these waves coming, and all I know is that this is now going to happen. And right after that, Father started telling me and uh, showed me that he wants me to go on a 40-day fast. Now, I've never been on a 40-day fast. I actually love fasting. It's the most amazing thing that he has ever um, wanted his, his body to do. And um, so... But I will never go on a fast unless he actually confirms it to me. And if he wants me to go on a lengthy fast like that, then he has to confirm it to me in multiple waves because I do not trust my heart. Right? So he has to confirm it in ways I don't look for the confirmations. They must come to me. And so Father confirmed it in a matter of 40 minutes, uh, probably four or five times that he wanted me to go specifically on a 40-day fast. Um... So, when I look back on the word that he gave for 2023, I realized that that word is not just a personal word for me, but that it's a corporate word. And with reference to the type of suffering that he's talking about, and it's coming in different ways, is basically preparing our hearts for what is to come. Okay, so during this, I would say probably three months now, on a daily basis, I would get the number 69 and 96 a few times a day, even today still. I get it over and over and over, and eventually um, Father showed me that the number 69 is a reference to Psalm 69 and Psalm 96. Now Psalm 69, I will be reading a few uh, verses from that for you now, um, that you can read with me please. and. Um, but I'm not going to read Psalm 96. Psalm 96 is basically the opposite of Psalm 69, which is about praising and worshipping Him and exalting Him. It's just about giving all the praise and all the honor. So let's start with Psalm 69 that He gave me. Now, in Psalm 69, is um, you can also read Psalm 88 with it. It's a kind of a type and shadow of the tribulation of time that we will go through, as well as Psalm 18. And um, it's also a messianic psalm where you clearly, um, as I read it now, you will see, where you will clearly see how Yeshua is uh, depicted in what David speaks um, of what he has to endure. So I'm just going to read that now. That's in Psalm 69. It'd be good if you can follow me. Note how it starts with regards to water. You'll find the same in Psalm 18. Okay, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I'm come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restore that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake, let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame have covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the reproaching of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb 
to them. They that sat in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord. In acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth over me, or upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. And hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And then just to verse 29. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. Listen how he ends this song. I will praise the name of God with a song. And I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs. The humble shall see this and be glad. Your heart shall live that seek God. So the reason why Father continually prepared my heart with Psalm 69 was to tell me and let me know that I was going to go through an experience of Psalm 69 and this is what the fast was about. So I just want to quickly just mention Acts 16 where we hear of um, Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas they were on their way to Macedonia, they were captured and they were flogged, their backs were ripped open, they were placed in stocks and they were thrown into a dungeon. Now, the prisons of those times obviously smelled, um, smelled more reeked and um, fear, um, you just can just imagine what it was like in that time. And here Paul and Silas is and the word says at midnight. Now at midnight is just, it's just a small word but why did the spirit lead the writer uh, Luke who wrote Acts why did he lead him to write the words at midnight because at midnight it's the darkest hour you cannot get darker than midnight it's the darkest hour and at midnight at the darkest hour of their lives a song rose from their innermost being and they started to worship and praise God with their tattered backs and torn backs to those prison walls bound they started worshipping and praised their God. And the word says that the prison doors opened and they didn't leave. The instruction wasn't given. They were not prisoners just because they were behind bars. They were free in themselves. But they sang and they worshipped and others were set free because of their worship and where they were at. Even the warden and his family were saved. And so this is what Father was saying to me. You are going to experience a fast where you will be tested in ways you've never been tested before. It is going to be very difficult and you're going to have to endure, but you're going to sing a song, a praise in your prison. And that was my portion. Now, at first, I didn't add one and one to get to two when I started this fast, but as I started it, the first thing that happened is that I realized that my back was sore. Now, my back um, I thought I was drinking maybe too much water, so I was just drinking water. And maybe, you know, my kidneys are telling me, you yeah, know, stop it, this is, this is too much. And then I realized, no, it's not my kidneys. Um, this is too low, the back pain. And as I laid on my back at night, I realized that the pain was so searing, it would go down my legs and 
even if I laid on either side or on my tummy I could not sleep due to the pain it was excruciating and what basically what it meant is not only did my body not get any food at that moment and fighting for food but it was also trying to survive the pain that I was going through so I was without sleep as well and it went on like that for about a week and um, obviously that drained me of any strength and I came to one point where I just um, took I decided to take uh, anti-inflammatories so that I could get some sleep because it ended up that I could not do anything in this fast I was actually I'm actually busy writing a book at this moment um, for for the left behind church but I'll tell you that afterwards but the point that I want to make is I was of no use because of this pain so I had to endure this pain and I also would be woken up certain times during the course of the night trying to sleep but then um, the times that father woke me up um, the meanings of the words or the numbers in the strong concordance would mean to endure to suffer so I took anti-inflammatories and um, that was that but the pain was still there and one night I just decided that's it I'm not going to take any I just take three in total and um, one night I just decided I don't care what it takes I'm going to sleep through this pain because he has a purpose with it he allowed it nothing can happen to me unless he allowed it and I went to him the next day and I said Lord why did you allow this in this fast because am I not to pray am I not to write am I not to do these things in this fast as I seek your face and then he clearly showed me a vision of his own back ripped apart um, as they um, flogged him with um, and the stripes on his back and as I realized the pain that was searing through my body because of the nerves that runs down my legs I suddenly realized that as his whole back was flogged open and shred to pieces the amount of pain searing pain as the nerves through his whole body was stinging him and the effect that it must have had on his body just the beating on his back and it broke my heart to be able to just have a small taste of that and how agonizing it was for me and how tiring it was to know that my savior endured that for us it was very overwhelming but the moment he showed me that was the moment where he took the pain away just like that and at that moment i realized that there would be more these were the waves that he was referring to that he was said that he told me that I was just to go with the waves that will take me to the shore at that moment my words to him was I'm ready for the next wave so I knew I was to endure whatever he brings on this fast so the next thing that happened to me is that um, I started to get a lot of heartburn now usually when I fast I um, fasting for me is a breeze it is I am so aware of him carrying me through it I seldom seldom um, am I hungry on a fast that is the least of it um, and I i am very strong I'm gross spiritually very uh, receptive and so for me to fast is an absolute joy this fast was the complete opposite so I knew his hand was on it and he had a purpose with it so here I was and I'm getting heartburn. I've never had heartburn on any fast whatsoever. So I have heartburn. I have heart, heartburn 24 hours a day. I would wake up in the middle of the night with heartburn and I can only drink water. So I drink water. So I thought, okay, let me do a study on, let's see, you know, just do some research on why am I getting heartburn while I'm fasting. And basically it's got to do with your, your stomach acids that are now out of balance because it doesn't have any food. And they said that what makes it worse if you take an anti-inflammatory, well, which I took. And that for me in itself was at least actually Father's hand because I probably would not have had um, heartburn if it wasn't for the anti-inflammatories because I don't normally get um, heartburn on a fast. So it's kind of like he caused it. And once I understood that this was his doing once again, um, it was horrible. <laughs> Um, he took me once again to Psalm 69, where it says there, let me just read that part again. Um, it says here, verse 21, 
They gave me also gal for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And at that, that moment, he was saying to me that he endured, not necessarily a heartburn, but what he endured is the gal, the bitterness of life, and, and heartburn itself, and, and um, just the hardness of life, even to the point of tasting it, and that it was his portion. And there was nobody there on the cross to say to him, it's okay, don't worry, you'll get off you soon. Don't worry, we're praying for you. The word says he found no comforters. There was nobody for him. And so the moment I understood what he was showing me, um, the moment, at that very moment, he took the heartburn away. At that moment, I said, Father, right, I'm ready for the next wave. There was, it was seldom that a day went past for the next wave to come. Never longer than a day. So the next wave was complete fatigue. I was exhausted, utterly exhausted to the point where I had to take regular breaks. I could not brush my teeth um, standing. I had to sit. Um, I couldn't do my hair. Um, I, I had to clean the house, but I had to do it during the course of days. Um, anything I did was met with absolute exhaustion. And when he showed me this spot again, I was once again just floored. When I saw, I had this picture of him being flogged and his whole body and the tiredness and the pain that's searing his body. And I saw the Via Dolorosa and this cross beam upon his shoulders. And as reminded of his word that he gave in 2023, where he ends with that he will place the burden on my shoulders, but that I'm to look to him. And this is how it felt. Every day felt to me like a Via Dolorosa. Impossible to put one foot before the other. It was the pain and the exhaustion was too much to take. And there are people that are so overwhelmed with exhaustion because of sickness, because of life, of things that they endure. And that was what he was carrying on Via Dolorosa. The battle of life and the extremity of life, of how it takes us and causes us to suffer. And that he has so much compassion on us. And that he endured the Via Dolorosa. And at one aim. And that was to be crucified on that cross. And once he showed me that. He lifted the exhaustion. The next thing that came my way. Was that. Um, I had a deficiency in magnesium. I wasn't aware that I had this deficiency. I actually thought that I had a deficiency in salt, that water that I was drinking maybe didn't have enough salt. But at one stage, I took salt and my body violently rejected it. And I knew it wasn't sweet or salt that my body needed. And the thought that came to me was maybe he wants, maybe it's magnesium. So I looked up the um, symptoms of deficiency and I had all the, the symptoms of it. That night, he gave me a dream in which he was drinking a smoothie of avo and um, banana and he gave it to me to drink as well and um, I knew that he was saying to me I need to get magnesium and it was a confirmation that I need to get magne magnesium into my body as soon as possible. And you need to understand that when at this stage what I was enduring was exhaustion to the point where I truly believed that my family was going to find me on the floor, probably dead or they would have to call the ambulance. I was at the point where I knew that I probably need a drip into my body um, pretty soon or else I wouldn't make it. I could not even cut the smallest things like mushrooms or something without having to lie over the kitchen table and being able, unable to breathe. I was sick. And at that moment, I said to him, Father, what are you showing me here? And what he showed me in the word in Isaiah 53, where it talks about that it pleased the Father. I'll read that, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, it's called the Psalm, or the, the chapter of the suffering servant. Where it says, all those who are godly will endure persecution. Um, let's see here. Verse 10, so, um, Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. 
when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It pleased the Father to do this to the Father, uh, to the Son, in order to make him an offering for sin. Now, to put him to grief, he's the, um, the Strong's Concordance uh, number that put to grief is H2470. And to put to grief means to become weak or sick, diseased or ill. So it pleased the Father to literally make the Son sick on our behalf. And this is what he wanted me to experience. The kind of exhaustion to the point of death, which he endured by carrying our sickness upon his body. Not just on his back, but even made sick himself on the cross. So this is what he meant by putting me through Psalm 69. He wanted me to endure the things of the cross. Okay, so... At one point, when I read, um, when I went through the first part of the fatigue, he showed me the Via de la Rosa. He led me to Psalm 27. And in Psalm 27, David says, um, let me read it. This really touched my heart deeply as I was reading it. Because at night time, remember, I could not do anything in this time. I was completely depleted of any strength. I could not even pray. I did not once, not once, lose my joy in the Lord. Not once. All I had was to worship and praise Him. That is literally all I could do. Um, what did I say? What did I want to read? Psalm 27. Okay, Psalm 27. Psalm 27, um, I really suggest you read Psalm 27 after this whole devotional teaching on your own time. But this part caught my attention because I was that night sitting here in my uh, prayer room and praying and just saying, oh, not praying, just saying to him, I can't, I, I, I mean nothing in this fast. I, I'm basically just enduring hardship. I don't understand. At that stage, I couldn't, I didn't fully understand. I'm utterly weak. I'm so desperate. And um, this part caught my attention. He says, um, verse 8, When thou sayest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. And when I read that, a desperate cry came out of my whole being. Leave me not. Because I've never been that weak in my life. And a sense of desperateness that gripped my being, of being left by God, even though I knew he would never leave me. That mere thought coupled with my absolute weakness was so devastating the thought that I begged him not to leave me. I begged him not to forsake me and at that moment Yeshua said to me, I cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At the time where Yeshua felt this and far more than I could ever have felt, his cry came up, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that I never would have to feel that and so that you never would have to feel that in the time to come. Because there will be times that we will, to a degree, cry out and know that Yeshua carried that for us on the cross. So, this is a lot of things that I went through and at one stage, uh, the last thing that I went through was my tongue that was exceptionally dry it, and my throat it was so dry that um, I could feel the ridges on my tongue and my tongue would stick to my throat and father reminded me of um, when I asked him what it was about oh by the way the magnesium deficiency went away after three days of drinking banana and um, avo smoothies 
um, it went completely away. So he took that away once I understood as well. So the tongue dry part is we find in Isaiah 53 verse 7 where it talks about Yeshua that was silent as a, sh a sheep before his shearers and against those who accused him. And we find the same type and shadow of Ezekiel. Let's just read that in Ezekiel 3. Now, Ezekiel is called the son of man, a type and shadow of Yeshua. So, oh, I just opened there, wonderful. Ezekiel 3, verse 26 to 27, and this is what he is told. He says to him, I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are rebellious house. So he was showing me what Yeshua endured, even in that moment of his mouth being dry and unable to speak a word before his accusers. Okay. So during this period of this fast when I got to the point where I was basically thinking um, I might die I was sitting in a, a bath of Epsom salt that has a lot of magnesium in it and I was aware of um, the fight that was going on within the spirit world uh, with regards to what he was doing within me and at, at some point I started desperately to cry out to him and say to him I do not care what this fast will do, even if it means I am in hospital, but I will not stop. I will not stop until I've reached that 40th day. I don't care what it takes. I don't, even if he, he has to come, I will still continue with this fast. And I was so determined and I begged him to give me the grace to endure. I was determined. I, I cannot explain it enough. Unbeknownst to me, that was a watershed moment because something in me at that moment, he performed. He did something in me in that moment, in my spirit, that was I was unable to do. This was something that Richard Wurmbrandt mentioned in Tortured for Christ. He said in all his 14 years of seeing people being tortured and him being tortured himself, he has learned one thing and that the spirit of man is stronger than his flesh or his body. Your spirit is able to endure far more than what your body can endure. And that is the threshold that he took me over. It is also the threshold he will take his children over. So what happened is, uh, well, let me just read a quote from, from Spurgeon as well that I thought was just so applicable to this. Let me just see if I can find it. Okay, I found it. So this is what Spurgeon said. And he's talking about Yeshua that set his face like a flint. I think it's in Matthew 22 where he talks about Yeshua knew that it was his time to be made that's an offering um, in Jerusalem and he told his disciples that he was going up to Jerusalem and they thought no not a good idea they're looking for you but the word says that he set his face like a flint to go up to Jerusalem and this is what Spurgeon wrote about this he says my great object is to lead you to love him who so loved you that he set his face like a flint in his determination to save you O oh, you redeemed ones, on whose behalf this strong resolve was made. Ye who have been bought by the precious blood of steadfast, resolute Redeemer, come and think a while on him, that your hearts may burn within you, and that your faces may be set like flints to live and die for him who live and died for you. Then he says, the set purpose to redeem his people was an all-consuming passion that ever burned within his soul. For what he said once to his disciples, he felt always. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. He longed to be at it. 
This is the place where I was, sitting there in my bath, saying, in a way, I have a baptism to be baptized with. I was willing to go through all 40 days. I don't care what wave was coming next. Every time a wave was finished, I was ready for the next wave. Come may be what it is. And I'm not blowing my, rooting my own horn. I'm talking about what he does in our spirits to bring us to that threshold where there is that water shed moment where you count all things lost. Loss. Okay. So the word of God tells us in Proverbs 25 verse 28 says, A man who has no rule of his spirit is like a broken down or like a city broken down without walls. And in Song of Solomon, Solomon, we also read about the, uh, 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 the virgin daughter or his love. That is, she's compared to a city or a, let's just read it. She's walled in. The word says she's walled in. Song of Solomon, verse 8, ach, chapter 8, verse 8. We have a little sister and she hath no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? If she be a wall... Well, we, we will build upon her a palace of silver. If she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Then he, she says, I am a wall and my breast like towers. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. I'm reading you this so that you can understand that um, our hearts have walls. So this is talking about a heart. When I went into this fast, I knew without a doubt that this fast was for to prepare me for what's to come and that it was to fortify me, to strengthen my spirit man. I knew without a doubt this is what this fast would be like. So here we have, and she's compared, and she's told that she's like a wall. Now our heart, I prayed specifically, enlarge my heart, give me a greater capacity capacity to endure what is to come this is what this is about so the, our hearts have walls our hearts have um, chambers like rooms our hearts have doors those are the valves so here we talk when he talks about her as a as a wall he's referring to a heart as well if you look at it in this context so it's an enlargement of the heart that takes place during suffering in order to cause us to endure and strengthen our spirit man to the extent that we will be able to endure whatever suffering comes our way because the spirit is stronger than the body. In fact, basically what it means, if you look at the meaning of ruling your spirit, I'll just tell you what that is. I looked it up. It means the, the ruah is your spirit. It means your mental ability, you know, the, to be able to, your emotions and all those parts that makes you up who you are, to be able to control that. But the flip side of that is that which I spoke about, the word that Father gave that's called glory. And here is what the spirit does in the spirit man when you endure suffering, which is exactly what happened in Christ. It says here, it's inspiring Ecstat the ecstatic state of prophecy, impelling prophet to utter instruction or warning, imparting warlike energy and executive and administrative power, manifesting the Shekinah glory. So you find the two sides of when you rule your spirit man, when your 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 thoughts and your emotions and your spirit, and you are strengthened, that, that inner man is strengthened with might by the spirit, your heart is enlarged, a greater capacity is given to endure. That is when the glory of God is made manifest through hearts that have overcome the flesh in suffering. So what I want to say to this as well is that during this period, I actually went through a stage where the spirit came over me, where I actually longed, longed, cried out, had a desire and a passion to die for him. It wasn't out of a, uh, what a great idea, one day, you know, this is what we call to, um, we need, no, it was a burning desire to die for him. 
So what I'm saying with you is that there is a transcendent place that Father brings us through in our suffering where we will overcome and be a manifestation of the cross in power and glory by how we lay our lives down. We will, it will be a joyful suffering and joyful martyrdom because we will long for it. We will give our lives willingly and we will have a desire to be baptized just as him. And before I went into this fast, Father gave me the, the uh, specific scripture of Philippians 3. Let's just go there. This is what it was all about. I didn't understand that this is what he was showing me until I was in the fast. That he was giving me the privilege to share in his suffering. Philippians 3 from verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I can not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting that things which are behind and reaching forth unto things that which are before me. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Think of Yeshua that was determined and set his face like a flint to apprehend that which he was apprehended for. Think of Paul as a type and shadow of Yeshua after the resurrection, setting his face, always wanting to be made conformable unto his death. I went through this fast in order to be made conformable unto his death. What needed to be made perfect in me in that moment was that uh, watershed moment of being able to go over from wanting to just you know, the suffering to end, to not wanting suffering to end, but to endure it for his glory. And this is what he wanted to perfect in me. That is the perfection that he wants to work in us. This is why in James 1 we read, very familiar scripture, James just after Hebrews. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Here's that perfection again. There's a perfect work that is doing in us, in our suffering. And how we suffer, whether we praise him in our prison, whether we praise him in our pain, whether we reach that point of, of, of no turning back, willing to endure whatever it takes in order for him to do what he needs to do, it's then where he can display his glory and will display his glory in the time to come. So the question, um, you know, what... What I ask myself when I look back on, on everything that is done, I ask myself, why did he want me to endure all of this? Well, the first thing was to fortify me. And in Jeremiah um, 1, he tells him that he's making a brazen wall, a fortified uh, 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 city. So it's to fortify, and that's almost like a, a lighthouse in a storm. Um, the other thing is, as well, is that he wanted to enlarge my heart, give me a greater capacity to suffer, to perfect that which concerns me, right? If we go to Hebrews 5, verse 7 to 8, very important scripture that, print, that talks about Yeshua as our intercessor, right? 
Hebrews 5, verse 7 to 8. Think of the weakness in crying out, the type and shadow of what the church will be going through. What he showed me, I went through. It says here, verse five, verse, chapter 5, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, there's that word perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Through all his suffering, what he endured, and how he cried out to the Father, there was a point that nobody would be able to stop him from getting to the cross. Just like I reached a point where nobody would stop me from stopping this or, or from uh, um, going through this whole fast unless he did it and so there's there's that point that you reach that it takes us to and that made me think of somebody sent me a clip on burn the ships king and country sings the song burn the ships where and there's different examples of of this where the sailors came to this new uh, uh, land and they didn't know what was happening on the side. They were fearful, demotivated. Um, they uh, wanted to turn back and the captains ordered the ships to be burned um, because once the ships are burned, there's no plan B, C, D, E, some other escape route. No, once the ships are burned, you're only going forward. There's only one way to go and my ships were burned. His ships was burned. Paul's ships was burned. They were all burned. There was no, oh, hopefully we'll do this, hopefully that. There was a set fast determination. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And nobody could stop them except God. And so, um, there came a point on the 20th day where I was at that point where there was no turning back. For me, it wasn't a question of whether I'll make it. <laughs> I was going to make it. It was a question of just, I'm going to. And I had a vision where he showed me a crow with a napkin on, a yellow napkin. And I was like, I know where you're going with this. I was adamant. I was angry. I did not want to stop. And the reference told me to go read 1 Kings 17, where Elijah was told that the Lord God gave the ravens... Um, command to feed him meat and bread and water and was basically telling me to finish my fast um, that a fast is finished and I cried I cried I cried I cried I didn't want to finish I did not even though it was him telling me to finish I was rebellious almost in a way that's how much I wanted to finish it for me it was the equivalent to a, a, a runner or somebody exercising for the Olympics and he's got two races to run he finished the one race only to be told the next one he doesn't have to run but he trained so hard for it it's as if all my life I've trained for this moment and he tells me to stop and the reason why he told me to stop because he knew that only he could stop me it wasn't going to be somebody else that stopped me and he confirmed it in various ways after that And for days after that, I still cried because I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to prove anything to him. I didn't want to prove anything to me. It wasn't about that. It's because I understood that there was a fire in me, an endurance that could not stop. No matter what. He gets all the glory and all the honor for that. And not long after that, I saw a, a clip of a... Olympic ice skater, he doesn't skate anymore, but what this man could do was just up to, please don't ask me, some Russian guy, I don't know. <laughs> it's just amazing what he could do, and it's just a small clip of his last performance, and he went very slowly down, and he kissed the ice, and he held his cheek to the ice. And I didn't know what that was about, and it just caught my attention, and I read the comments on it, and it showed that it was his last performance. 
that just did it for me. Because it was like I understood that you have been prepared for so long to go through something so vigorous. Just be told, you can stop now. I know you can do it. You've proven yourself. And it made me think of a book of martyrs that I'm reading now. Of this martyr whose family went before him and they were all his grandfather, I think, with 20 years or 25 years in prison. His father went in prison and this martyr was talking about the times he'd been in prison and when he went to prison. The same prison where his own grandfather and the generations before him were. He was a Muslim and he um, became saved and he fell on the ground and he kissed the floor. So honoured to be counted worthy. To be persecuted and then I thought of the passion the movie where Yeshua grabs the cross it's my favorite scene it always arrested me and he holds the cross like this a close-up and he kisses it it's almost like he cherishes it and it made me think of kissing the hand that smites him that we ought to kiss the hand for the work that he does in us he works in the dark where we cannot see and he does amazing things to perform this in us. So the disposition that he works in us is that of fearlessness, but not just of fearlessness, but of endurance, and not just endurance, but of faith. The word fortitude means to strength of mind to endure pain or adversity with courage. Strength, force, power to attack or to resist attack. A mental power of endurance, patient courage under affliction, privation or temptation, firmness in con confronting danger, hardship or sufferings. Paul and Silas. <laughs> this is what he's called us to. To be a visible demonstration in the time to come in suffering, not from the absence of suffering. As that 2023 word says, that... Um, in order to experience his glory, we have to be made conformable unto his death in suffering. And we have to be willing, willing, have a fortified mind, for a fortitude to go into suffering with this mind, I will not give up. Work in me what needs to be worked in me, even now, with what he causes you now to endure. Working that character in us, that was the same in him, that set his face to go up to Jerusalem. And I want to read a word. I'll just end with this word. Now my name is Petra, which comes from Peter. And this word Father gave me in November 2021. And um, just like I said, it's a personal as well as a corporate message to the church. So I'm just going to read it. It's no coincidence that you're called Peter. I've called you, I've named you for my purposes, needing you to become strong only in me, to stand in the midst of the storm. For the gates of hell will indeed come against my church, my rock, my stones, but they will not prevail. Therefore, know that it is for such a time I am preparing you, to be strong, resolute, and stable in me. I alone am your strength. Without me, you can do nothing. Have I not said that the righteous are as the mountains that cannot be moved? Do not fear the floods. Do not fear their words. But stand resolute in the strength that I am. This word shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night. For my word will not return void. Even in the greatest of storm, it stands. When your life is built on my word and you do my will, you shall not be moved. Therefore, my child, do not look to the left or to the right, but fix your gaze on that which I have apprehended you for. To be my pillar of faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So listen, obey and trust me. Trust me that I will hasten to perform my words spoken through you. Great exploits for which I'm preparing you. You cannot do this unless 
you are established in my word unless you are built on a rock. Therefore, as I've said, focus my little stone built up in me, the rock of ages cleft for you. Father, thank you for this word. I know, Father, it's not an easy word, but I pray, Father, that this word will pierce the conscience, the spirit of us that need to hear it for the time to come. That we will set our minds like a flint, be prepared to endure whatever comes our way, knowing that you will never cause us to endure one thing more than what you have predetermined and what you know we can endure. You determine the boundaries of all our testing. We are your children. Father, our only purpose is that you may be glorified. As vessels, we lay our lives down to prepare you for you to prepare us, make us vessels of honor in the Master's house. We humble ourselves before you, Father. We pray not our will, but your will be, your will be done. In everything we do, we welcome the hand that smites us, that we may kiss it. You are the strength of our life. We wait upon you to strengthen and enlarge our hearts. We pray this in the name of Yeshua.